Welcome, CS235, lecture 19, our last lecture. I know you're all heartbroken. That actually sounded quite heartfelt. I appreciate that. Um, so there are two parts to today's lecture. They're both brief. One is a verbal spanking from me about misuse of ball bearings, and then the next is a survey. Do you really want to do it in that order? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I want to maximize the time that your, your mental derrieres have to sit on the seat and feel bad about the spanking. <laughs> so go ahead and pass these out to yourselves. If anyone doesn't have a pen, I have pens. Okay, so most of you are, well, about two thirds of the class is solid on ball bearings and the rest are doing weird things with them. So, uh, as far as why I'm not talking about other things we haven't already discussed today, um, you all have a final project, and you're tired and I'm tired, and honestly, I got through basically everything I wanted to discuss. There are some little bits and pieces, but at this point, they, they, it's not really worth it. So, we got through most of the material, basically everything I wanted to get through for the course, so that's good. So, but I do want to hammer home this last point. So real quick, I have a robot arm. Let's take a robot elbow. Okay, one link, second link, a fine specimen. And uh, how many bearings would I want for this elbow? Who said four? You did that just screw with me, didn't you? <laughs> this is why I'm talking about this. Okay, our options are one, two, three, four, and I'll just put four plus. Now let's discuss these. Why not one? It's going to wiggle. So I'm going to redraw the guts of a ball bearing. Okay, so what's the part I'm coloring in right now called? Outer race and this part? Inner race. Inner race. And then these are the balls. Okay. Now let's zoom in on this. Okay. So we could draw this up here down here or in the middle. So you see we can, this is delta plus and delta minus. Everyone see that? How did we get rid of this? Huh? Uh, okay, so say I stick a Belleville washer right here. Will that do it? One bearing and a Belleville washer. Okay, we can add anything we want to this, and we'll still have play with one bearing. You can't get rid of play, you can't preload a bearing unless we have two bearings. No matter what we do, this is going to wiggle, okay? So we can't use one bearing because this will always wiggle, okay? Let's scratch that out. So let's put a second bearing in here. Then I take a shaft. Uh, assume that's a straight line. Sorry. Okay, now I'm going to put a shim here and say I'll put a shaft collar to lock it. Okay, now over here I put my shim, my bill of a washer, and then my shaft collar. Does that look familiar? We're good. So what's happening, just to draw again, is 
what we're doing, when we just install them, the balls are somewhere in the middle. And then what we're trying to do is squish the inner aces down. And I think it goes down to here. So this one goes up and this one goes down. That's called preloading. That takes care of our um, wiggle, okay? Now, this between the outer races is typically a fixed distance, L. And let's call that LO for outer. And now this distance between the inner is LI when we install it. What happens to LI when we preload it? It decreases. So minus some epsilon. The distance actually isn't between the outer races, but just the inner races. Just, yeah, the just the inner races. So uh, let's do it in a different color. Okay. So this is, does that help? So Li is just the distance between the inner races. Here, let's do this actually. Is this a little clearer? Li minus, there, how's that? Okay, so let's review. This is fixed, Lo, between the outer races. Li is what it is when we first install it, and then when we preload it, we subtract out epsilon. The other day when I was ranting about this, what I meant was some people were trying to put a spacer in here, right down here in between the inner races, such that this touched the inner race and this touched the inner race on the other one. This is Li. If this is a really stiff material, then we can't have our minus epsilon and then we're not preloaded. Okay? What happens if we tighten the bolt on both sides with this in the middle, great, it will feel tight, and then the entire assembly will shift, the entire inner race here, spacer and inner race here will shift back and forth as if there's just one big bearing, just one outer race and one inner race. Everyone see that? Okay, now, so that's two. Now what I saw some people doing is, say we have my elbow, and then, so one hole, and this is the bearing hole, okay? And so they were putting, uh, so this is bearing one, bearing two. And then I saw either they'd put two more bearings here, or they'd put one bearing here, or one bearing here. Um, it's not necessary. All you need is two bearings for one degree of freedom. So remember, this could literally be uh, a shaft that we've hammered in to press fit, and it rotates because of these bearings. That's sufficient. You only, for one degree of freedom, you only ever need, unless we do something fancy and we're talking about thrust bearings that then we're aligning with uh, a different bearing, that's a different case. Don't worry about that. There are special cases where you use more than two bearings. Uh, in this case, for what we're doing and 99% of what robotics people do, it's two bearings per degree of freedom, rotary degree of freedom, okay? So we're going to take a stick here, and then this goes into the two bearings. If we add a third bearing, it doesn't do anything. If we add two more bearings, it doesn't do anything, okay? So there's no need to do three. Now say we were going to do this. Say we want to get, yep? What if you have another link parallel to the... Okay, does it ro does it rotate independently? No. No. Uh, let's see. Then that doesn't matter. So what you're saying is let's draw a stick like this and then put that in its own link. But what you're saying is that these two, let's ground it over here. Yeah. Okay? Well, you tell me. I'm going to give myself some shims so I don't touch the inner races. And then will this rotate independently of this? Yeah. So this will rotate independently of the U-joint with two bearings. And we've got shims here so we don't touch the outer race. The only reason why, anyone know why some people are doing U-joints? Access? No. 
No, because in this case, we didn't touch the bearings. We left the bearings alone. Okay, if I have two joints, this is one link, and this is the second link. And then this is one bearing, and this is the second bearing. And then this is my shaft. Okay? Which is stronger, this or doing... Assume all the dimensions are the same. So, same link, same two bearings, same link, same two bearings. Which is stronger, this one or this one? This one. I said this twice. <laughs> Thank you. Top or bottom? Bottom. Bottom. Okay. So this is the good one. And why? Because the second arm of the U can resist the moment. Yeah. So this resists moment loading. Yeah, so one trick we could do to make this stronger, is, and I'm drawing these all separately so we don't get confused, is we could put one bearing here, one bearing here, and then in between we put the link there, and we put the shaft like that. So in this case, the bearings are separated further so they can resist torques more. Okay? Um, anyone know why this is a pain in the ass? Uh, well, we have to space this somehow. Um, you have to clamp this plate to the shaft in some way so it doesn't move back and forth, right? If it moves back and forth, it will be in the wrong place. What are we, how are we going to locate this? We either have to have a nice clamp so that it doesn't move, or we have to put shims from the inner race. And then installation is a total pain in the butt. So you're free to do this, just know that it, it, it's a little bit annoying in terms of designing and making a nice clamp or putting shims so that it doesn't walk back and forth and installing it. Okay? So, but again, we only have two bearings. Now, let's say we, some people I have seen, remember the first joint, that's the one with the highest loads, they want to make sure that they really can handle the loads well. So what they're doing is they're putting one bearing here and then a second bearing here and then just for good measure they're putting like a third one right here. Wow, I just can't draw today. Okay, and then they're putting the shaft down through this. So this is three bearings. Why is this bad? It's over constrained. If you are worried that two bearings can't handle the loads, then change the loading schematic. Separate the bearings or get bigger bearings or do something other than over constraining the problem. That's like saying, okay, well my table, you know, I've eaten too much parfait today and so this is going to break if I sit on it. So I'm just going to start crazy gluing 20 legs on it. That's a bad idea. This is, it's already over constrained with four and adding 20 more legs it's just going to make the overconstraining worse. So just give it beefier legs or put me on a diet, one of the two. So stop putting more than two bearings in a row. Don't use, don't put another bearing here or here. Uh, four plus is just ridiculous. And now let me come back to a rant from a previous day. And I want this to be very clear. And I'm actually going to draw the whole thing out this time. Because the last rant about four bearings resulted in everyone trying to use four bearings. I was trying to say not to use four bearings. Okay. So some teams are doing something like this. Okay. And that's the shaft. So let's call this theta 1. And this is theta 2. So these are completely independent joints. There's a single shaft. And let me draw sort of the other way. Okay. So this is the shaft. And then they have sort of one link here 
and then I'll draw the other over here. Okay? Anyone know why I might want to do this? It's compact. So I have two joints on the same axis. Imagine it's like this, okay? It's like a scissor. My elbow is a single shaft and then I can move my right arm or I can move my left arm, okay? How many bearings do I want in this assembly? Okay, let's have a show of hands for two and a show of hands for four. Four wins the day. Let me draw another picture for you. I decided actually I don't want the shafts on top of each other. I'm going to move them. Now how many bearings do I want for here? Show of hands for two. None. Try to draw things in your mind if you get confused. There's no, there's no difference between the number of bearings I need here and the number of bearings I need here. If I take two arms and put them on the same shaft, or I take two arms on different shafts, it's the same thing in terms of I have two independent degrees of freedom. So I need four bearings here, and I need four bearings here. But let's draw it. So one, two, three, four. Now the offending people were getting rid of these two. And in their stead, we're putting a spacer. What did I say about the spacer? Don't do that. It's not preloaded. Okay? Now the other thing is, and I've seen some people have robots that have to be assembled order of operations, but it's crazy order of operations where it's like if one screw comes loose on something, they have to take apart the entire robot to tighten that screw. Sometimes you have to, but that is so painful, believe me. Having lots of those in my dissertation robot, just because it's unavoidable, try to avoid it at all costs. So let's think about this. Say, for the sake of argument, that I'm wrong and this works great and you can use a spacer and preload it and everyone's happy. Okay? Um, I want to assemble these two. Everyone see we're doing a little thought experiment that's mathematically impossible, but we'll do it for fun. I'm going to take this off. I decided I'm going to cable this up, okay? So I install my shaft. Let's ground the shaft. And I put on this first one, and I cable it up. What's going to happen when I try, say this is my, my shaft, and then I try to cable it up? And remember, I don't have the second arm. I only have this one arm with one bearing, and I'm going to install the cable. How's that going to work out for me? What's going to happen? It's going to wobble. Not only is it going to wobble, what's going to happen, remember this second bearing doesn't exist yet because I haven't assembled it yet. I'm going to put this cable and the whole thing's going to do this because I only have one bearing. Okay? That means even if mathematically this is possible, I have to put both arms on for either one of these to be cableable for me to install cables. That's not a good design. There's no reason why to cable this one, this one should have to be installed when all I have to do to solve this is get rid of that spacer and put one bearing, two bearings, and then I'm good. If I have two bearings, does this have to be, the top arm have to be installed for me to cable the lower one? No. How about this? Does the bottom one have to be installed for me to cable the top one? No because they have two bearings and they're not going to wobble back and forth. So this is a, a thing of just because even a lot of the time I get the argument of um, yeah but, but I could do this, right? Well sure you could do this but I haven't been trying to teach you the range of possibilities in terms of things you can do but they suck. I've been trying to teach like best practices. Just because you could do it one way but it would be very painful doesn't mean you should do it. So one of the most important things in mechanical design is how you're going to assemble it. Do I have to have part A connected for me to do something to part B? As much as possible, try to have everything sort of on its own so I can, um, if I need to fix this one, I don't have to take this one off. Right? You want to be able to fix this part of the robot without disassembling the whole thing. Are there any questions about 
what I've just said or anything else related specifically to ball bearings and their usage. Why don't you preload from inside? Okay, so let's do that. You tell me. So let me <coughs> draw my plate. Okay, so this is a plate. And let's draw from above. Here's my plate, and there's a hole in it. So how are you going to preload it? Normally, it's where you have written L-I-E. Yeah. And then you take the Belver washer both ends up, and then you take the Belver washer on the outside way. Okay, so you want a, a Belver washer there and a Belver washer there? Okay, and what else? Need to... uh, what else do we need? That's going to preload the bearing to the other side. So we've got a Belver washer and a Belver washer. Let me give you a hint. This is 12.7 millimeters. These are 0.7 millimeters. What else do we need? A shim. A shim? How many shims? So 0.7, 0.7 is 1.4. So uh, what is that? That's 11.3 millimeters. So we'd need something that's 11.3 millimeters, right? Or so something around then? We need something precise. No, really. I mean, the double wash is compressible, right? So, if, I mean, which, what are you doing? The diameter or are you doing the length? Um, what is this I'm trying to get you to see this sucks, but I'm not doing a good job. Basically, if I install this in the plate, then I have to install the Belva washer and the spacers, like these shims, and another Belva washer. Then I have to install this bearing. And then uh, I believe the shims are 14 millimeters in diameter, but this is a 22 millimeter diameter hole, which means my shims are going to be nowhere near the center. So then I have to stick my shaft through and do ring around the rosy where I get every single shim through it. And I have to do this as I install this bearing from behind, because remember, I'm compressing it with the bearing installed. So let's go through this. So I have my first bearing. And then I put my shims and my Belvo washers, and they're not aligned. I try to align them by eye. Then, as I put in the second bearing, it compresses it, but it's not aligned, so it's getting compressed into a place where it's not aligned. So I have to put a pin gauge from reverse to align everything as I compress. So that's a very long, complicated process for preloading it. Or I could put a single Belvo washer here and be done with it. So that's why we don't put it on the inside. Any other questions about ball bearings? The other question I had was when you did the four, right? You can just press it from the top. You can, you can fill the fuel up there. Right? You can just press it with the shaft in because it doesn't need to be moving, right? The shaft is grounded. Yeah, you can shaft, ground the shaft from the top piece, right? I mean, in fact, for our, for our elbow, because you only need one to move. I want them both to move independently. Yeah, assume this is the shaft, and then I have one arm and second arm on it. That's why you need four bearings. And it's particularly important because there are mechanisms. Uh, one of you, Camilo? Camilo? Camilo. Camilo had this awesome design. Uh, have any of you been to, uh, man, what's that place? I get dragged there a lot. Pottery Barn. Have any of you seen the lamps? I, my wife, not me. Have any of you seen the lamps at Pottery Barn where as you move them, there's like this a series of cables and belts that keeps like the lamp thing parallel to the ground? It's really cool. Go to a Pottery Barn and start tweaking things until they kick you out. So Camilo had this, this brilliant idea to basically do that for the robot arm. So basically, um, you know, you have a series of belts so that, say this is your gripper, as you move the robot ar arm around to a new configuration, the gripper is always in the exact same orientation. It's really cool. So ask Camille about it, or go to Pottery Barn, or do both. Um, now this hinges on there being a first shaft that never moves with respect to ground. The reason I'm saying this is so often you need a shaft that doesn't move with respect to ground. 
and you need all of the other linkages to move with respect to that grounded shaft. So that's why Keith's question of why don't we just bolt, press fit it to one of those doesn't work because actually in a lot of very common cases we need that shaft grounded and we need the other two links to be with respect to that ground, that concentric shaft ground. We need the shaft to be grounded, okay. Not in all cases, but in, in many very practical and everyday mechanisms, yes. And so then that's why you need the four bearings. Any other questions? Our elbows, we can ground the shaft in this guy. One last time? In our religion, one elbow, right? We can ground the shaft. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about two independent degrees of freedom, not our elbow. Any other questions about ball bearings? Okay, I'll give you one last piece of advice because I hinted at it. This is sort of for your random perusal. Um, you're out of time to actually incorporate this for the final project, but it's cool, so I'll mention it. Does anyone know what a thrust bearing is? No? Seriously? Man. All right, write this on your, on your survey for things I didn't cover but you wish were. Thrust bearing. Okay. There are many types of thrust bearing. I'm just going to show you the real dumb one. I have a plate. I have a second plate. I have balls in between. We'll give ourselves a little race here so the balls don't escape. This is the central axis, and that's it. So the way this works is, if this is ground, then I sit an elephant on top here, and it can rotate around. Um, and basically, the way these are designed are meant for axial loads. This is the way you do huge axial loads, okay? So if I literally, if I wanted a turntable robot that I would sit on and it would just spin me around. And if I did that with skate bearings or that type of bearing, it would break the bearings. Would it break this? No, this is just simple rolling, right? But what do you think aligns this regularly? I'll give you a hint. McMaster, the really cheap ones, they don't have grooves here. It's literally a washer, another washer, and then there's this thing in between. Um, it's got the balls in it. It's called a cage. This is called the ball cage. Also existed in Victorian times. Um, so this is a little plastic thing, and these are the balls that are trapped inside so that they don't just fly off. But if in the McMaster, in the cheap ones, there are no grooves. It's just a wash, flat washer, flat washer, and a ball cage. What keeps this from just shearing? Anything? Nothing. So this can just shear that way. So what do we need to keep this from shearing? Are there any other bearings you guys have used in this class? Huh? Just any of the ball bearings you've used will do. So if we put in line with this, one of the normal bearings you've used, that aligns it radially. It also takes the radial loads. So, um, and then sometimes if you're getting tricky, they'll put a third bearing in, but we're not talking about that. I just want you to see, um, if you were to get a cheap uh, thrust bearing, you have to use a normal bearing to align it radially and take radial loads, and that would be fine. Um, I think it's. I think it's just one. I don't know. I've never actually built it this way, but every time I ask someone about it, this is how they tell me to do it. The point is, this is for radial alignment and loads. Um, if you really want to know how to do this, Google how to use a thrust bearing, and it will tell you how to use it. And sometimes these are not balls, sometimes they're uh, rollers. It's like um, 
radial aligned rollers. You'll see these sometimes. Rob, have you seen these? Yeah. I don't know what these are called. Some type of needle something, maybe a needle thrust bearing or something, I don't know. So these kind of roll around like this. Yep. So is the Lazy Susan like a thrust bearing? Depends on how they did it. Lazy Susan typically just refers to the geometry, like a really gigantic thin section bearing. But I've seen Lazy Susans that were some type of weird something that I couldn't describe, and I've seen ones that are just giant ball bearings, like uh, giant skate bearings. So it really depends. Now if you're really interested in this stuff, some of you have been looking at something called a turntable. Okay, and this is uh, this is kind of like a lazy Susan. These lazy Susan is just that's just not a technical term, but you can still order it off of McMaster. That's the things at the Chinese restaurants where it's family style. And then um, the turntable is both a sort of uh, vernacular term, but also a technical term. McMaster sells turntables, um, and I think. One of the leading people in this is Kadon, I think. Don't quote me on that. They're really expensive. You know you've got a good turntable if it's like over a thousand bucks. So when I was working at Lockheed Martin, there was a missile launcher and sort of the azimuth. Everyone know the term azimuth? Azimuth is the vertical axis. So this. Uh, the azimuth was a turntable. It's literally just a giant bearing and there are bolt holes on the outside and bolt holes on the inside. So if this is the turntable, hey I wasn't going to talk about technical stuff today, what did you guys do to me? So there are bolt holes on the outside and bolt holes on the inside. So you bolt this to say my table and then you bolt the inside to your robot. And then it turns, there's almost no play whatsoever. It, they've designed it so it can take both radio loads and gigantic thrust loads and it's it's like the really nice way to build missile launchers slash robots um, but I don't know how they're doing that it, it's one of these things where the generic term turntable covers a bunch of different designs in terms of how they're handling the loads anything else about these bearings I'll tell you about one last special case. There are things called uh, angular bearings. And this is, st the reason I didn't lecture on this to begin with is because I very highly doubt most of you will end up using these anytime soon because they're for gigantic stuff. Um, there are these things called angular bearings and the way they look is sort of a Okay. So there are two halves to the angular bearing that come apart. By the way, turntable or uh, thrust bearings, some of them come apart into three pieces. Some of them, they actually have something that bolts them together. They have engineered it so that you can't take it apart. Usually the more expensive ones don't come apart. This cone fits into here and then it rolls along these angled, these are called typically needles. They're cylindrical. They're instead of the spherical balls for ball bearings, these are cylindrical and oftentimes they'll use these for higher load applications because it's a line contact not a point contact. So if we have a rolling sphere, what type of contact is it? Point contact. And if we have a rolling cylinder, what type of contact is it? Line. So the stress is more distributed over a cylindrical roller. So these are for much higher load applications. You know where you see these a lot? Cars. These are called angular contact bearings. Okay. 
Now, Keith will enjoy this. Say I take two of these. Now, why do I have two of them? Please, to constrain it. And also, I want to preload them. Now, I'm going to zoom, zoom in way cartoonishly, okay? The way you use these is imagine the inner race sticks out. This is the inner race. And then on the other one, this is the inner race. This isn't always the case in terms of what I'm about to tell you is only for super ridiculously nice bearings. Masumi has these, and they're 110 bucks a pop per bearing. Okay, So if you just go to your car shop and say, I want an angle contact bearing, this probably doesn't apply. So what you do is say I have a hole, a mounting hole. Say I have a plate like this. Okay, and then I have another piece so let me take you through how this works this is a plate that we want to put a bearing in okay we need two so it's preloaded and constrained I'm going to sit this Let's, let's draw this. This is the inner race. I'm not touching the inner race with the plate, okay? And then this little thing here, this is like a flanged insert. And it only touches what? The outer race. When I bolt this down, and actually let me give myself a little clearance. Okay, so there's a gap here. There has to be gap. And then let's zoom in. The way this works is these inner races touch. When I install them, the inner races touch. The way you preload them is you bolt this thing down, and these are precisely ground so that if you bolt them tight, it precisely preloads to a known preload value. It's so that, remember that the delta in here that it's able to wiggle? They precision ground these so that if you put them on top of each other and squeeze, it perfectly takes out that delta and preloads it. Okay, So all you have to do, you don't have to do uh, an, a Belleville washer or anything. Put the two bearings in the hole, use the screws to tighten this down, and it's perfectly preloaded every time. That's why they're 110 bucks a pop. Um, now, how big is this inner race? Somebody guess how big this inner race is. Like this, this distance here. Smaller than you can see with the naked eye. I drew this cartoonishly so you'd see it. Practically, for your purposes, it just looks like this. And then somewhere down here with a microscope, there's the inner race. It's very tiny. But when you bolt them together, it preloads. Any other questions about bearings? So the outer races will touch? Uh, yeah. That the outer races touch because when you bolt it down, the inner races that were that are touching start pushing everything apart. Any other questions? Okay, survey time. Fill out them surveys and you're done. I will be around quite a bit this week. Uh, you have eight days left, so you know who you are. To those teams who have gotten a good start, congratulations, you're doing well. To those who have not and are still struggling, may the fear of God be upon you. There are only eight days left. <laughs> Who has the remaining surveys and pens? Can you call me? Yeah. Hey, what's up? Hey, guys. How's Oh, you have to sponsor it out something? Yeah. So it's great to the stack off. Okay. Cool. Thank you guys.